All right, now that we have the boss able to uh, attack, uh, able to parry randomly, um, and uh, also uh, uh, able to block us, and I show you that the player now has this um, teleport. Now let's also add movement. So right now, if I'm far away, the boss is just doing his thing. He's just attacking uh, because we're not telling the boss to move to the player. Um, now, uh, to tie back to rule number three as well, the boss won't just be walking to the player. The boss is powerful so that they, they should react differently to the player. When the player moves away from the boss, I don't want the boss to just follow them slowly. I want the boss to just teleport directly to them like the mage is able to teleport. Um, so like I mentioned, we'll be combining uh, stuff from the mage and melee enemies. Um, so we're going to copy the teleport from our BP enemy mage. Now you can also put it in your base enemy if you want this uh, teleport to be used by uh, all uh, enemies. But uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to copy it and paste it in the boss because I'm going to modify it a bit and I only want them for these two. Um, so I'm just going to comment this, call it attacks, I'll move it a bit down here, and paste the teleport. All right, and we're going to have to create some variables. Is teleporting, right click, create variable. Um, everything else is correct, correct, this capsule, this mesh. We need to uh, create this uh, event dispatcher on teleport end. Uh, teleport body effect and teleport trail. I'm actually not going to do a body effect here. I'm just going to do a trail. So again, making it just a bit simpler. Maybe we need to move this back. Um, so right click on the trail and create a variable. This one just refresh it because now it's created. And uh, we don't need this anymore because we're only destroying the trail and we don't have the body effect anymore. Um, everything else should be the same as compile. We have an error on teleport end, but we did create it. Maybe we need to just on teleport end. So I don't see any difference, but okay. Let's use this one. Compile, now it's not complaining. All right. Um, and one very important thing here is that right now this teleport takes a location. For our boss, I want them to teleport to the player uh, and not to where the player is. So I want them to take an attack target. Um, so I'm going to modify this teleport to take both a location or attack target. So if attack target is valid, then go there. If not, go to the location. And luckily, the move to function already has this. It has destination and an attack target. So all I have to do is just pass it in and the move to will take care of the rest. Um, and the acceptance radius, I want it to be a bit larger than 15. So I want you to move maybe uh, 150, um, yeah, 150 uh, units away from your target. That's fine. Um, all right, so now we need to create the task for it. So over here, new task, blueprint base, put it in our tasks folder and name it BTT boss teleport. And we start with boss because we are creating a boss task. So event receive execute AI, get our pawn, cast to boss, call teleport and pass in an attack target or a location, it depends. Um, so I'm gonna create one variable, just call it um, location or attack target key. And it's gonna be of type blackboard key selector. And this is the kind of the cool thing about blackboard keys is that they can have multiple values. This can be an attack target or a location. Uh, and we just get this and check. Uh, first, get value as actor. 
and then we check if it is valid. So if this is a valid actor, so plug in here, then call um, teleport with this um, attack target. If it is not a valid actor, so I'll just copy and paste the teleport off of boss here. Um, so if this is not a valid actor, then get value as vector. So then it's probably a location. And then once you're done, uh, assign on teleport end, plug it in both of these. So when the teleport is ended, we just call finish execute. And this is how you um, have one Blackboard value contain, uh, one Blackboard key contain multiple values. Um, all right, and now we can call it here. So in our combo sequence, before um, doing all of this, or maybe actually after setting focus and before attacking, let's do a teleport, a boss teleport to the attack target. And then as soon as you reach, then continue the attack. Whoa, he teleported past me. Oh, okay, no, no, he didn't. Let's watch again the teleport. Oh, I am missing one thing very important. You see the effect is on the floor, this teleport effect, right? Um, and the reason is because the mage enemy has different socket names than the boss. So we're attaching here to spine one for the uh, mesh, it's called spine underscore one for the Manny. For the other mage enemy, it's called spine one uh, without the underscore zero. Do we have anything else here? No, so now it should work. Let me do it slow motion. Yeah, okay, so now we have our effect. Perfect. Um, let me actually do this. Where am I? Before the focus. So first thing at all is teleport. Yeah, I think this is better. So teleport, then focus, and then attack. Great. Uh, but if I'm already close to the enemy, so if I'm already standing here, there is no point to teleport. So right now, why did he teleport? I'm already standing right in front of him. Um, so we wanna check, and before doing this teleport, um, are we at a certain distance from the enemy, uh, from the target or not? So I can add a decorator on this. So say a blackboard decorator and say, um, if the value of distance to attack target, which is a distance that's set by this service that we created before, and this just sets the distance to our attack target every 0.1 seconds. So we're gonna check if this value is um, less than or equal to 250, maybe something like that. So if it's less than or equal to 250, then teleport. Otherwise, don't teleport. But here's a problem. If this decorator fails, then this task fails. And when a task fails, the entire sequence fails. So we don't want that to happen. We only want this to be an optional thing. So teleport if you're far away, but if you're close, don't do it. But in either case, continue the rest of the attack sequence. And to do that, I'm gonna show you how to create optional tasks. And it's really simple. To do that, there is a decorator. So right click, add decorator. It's called uh, force success. Force success means regardless of the outcome uh, of uh, this condition, and regardless of the outcome of uh, this behavior tree task, this whole task will succeed always. So that makes it conditional. Even if the blackboard decorator fails, uh, the teleport will still succeed. The boss won't actually teleport, but the task itself will succeed. So now if we play, uh, oh, this shouldn't be if the distance is less than or equal, it should be if it's greater than or equal. So teleport if the distance is greater than or equal to 250, so if you're far away. So now, okay, now he should teleport, attack me. He's now close, so he shouldn't teleport. Great, so he just attacked me right away, he didn't teleport. And same again, if I'm at like this distance, teleported, okay. What about this distance? Didn't, perfect. 
All right, now let's start adding more attacks and more variability to the boss. So we have this uh, single uh, combo. Now let's add another one. Um, so I already told you I call this combo one because I have combo two here. And this is a three hit combo with the ending this uh, AOE slash. And again, uh, these are patterns that the player is already used to. So this is um, tied back to predictable but challenging. So the player knows that uh, this lightning slash is an AOE damage and knows that the regular sword swing is a, an axe swing from previous enemies. Um, and again, this just plays the axe swing sound, has the same red trail effect and the same lightning effect that we have for the regular smash of the melee and the player. I just made it red again because everything is <laughs> red for this uh, boss. Um, so let's create the attack. Now we don't have an attack similar to this, uh, something with a slash and an AOE slash in the BPC attacks, except for one. So if we go to the BPC attacks, we have... Um, this uh, spinning melee attack has a slash and an AOE slash, but I'm not gonna reuse it. I'm gonna create a new one and I'm gonna show you why. So over here in our attacks, I'm gonna create a new custom event, call it attack combo two, takes as input and attack target. And it's going to mimic what we already have in the BPC attacks, which is calling the attack uh, from the parent, which is, uh, uh, where is it? D -d -d yeah, call this attack from BPC enemy base. And then we play the montage, no, wrong one. Play montage, this one, in our skeletal mesh. And the montage is combo two. And then here we're gonna switch on name, plug it into notify begin. Remove the default and add two pins here. One pin is called slash and the other one is called AOE slash. Oh, goddamn, AOE slash. All right. So uh, the slash is the regular hits and the AOE slash is of course the explosion at the end. So for the slash, we already have these in the BPC attack. So BPC attack, we have uh, sphere trace on damage. Sorry, this is what we want to do. Um, we call sphere trace on damage and pass in the damage info. Say make damage info. 15 damage info melee can be blocked can be parried great radius um, let's say same as the regular attack so 40 and 220 220 whatever we did for this one we did 40 and 220 yeah um, and for AOE slash uh, we get BPC and call AOE damage which is also uh, a helper that we have well, what happened here a helper that we have on our BPC attacks. And the damage is going to be similar. Let's say it does 20 damage, this one. But this time it's explosion and can't be blocked and can't be parried and should force interrupt. Uh, and hit reaction here and hit reaction here, but won't really matter because we're not using it for the player. Radius, let's say a radius of 300. All right. And then on end, we need to do what we also do here, which is call uh, attack end. So for here, we call attack end. Uh, where is it on enemy base? So on completed, on interrupted, and pass in the attack target. Great. Um, now we have this combo, but we need a way to call it from our behavior tree. So we need to add it first to our boss attacks, enum. So open the enum and add combo two. Great. And then back here in our boss attack, open up the boss attack task in the attack based on name. You'll see combo two appears here. So just add it as well. Combo two 
plug it in, plug it in here and plug in the attack target. Great. So in my boss, if I just change this combo one uh, to combo two in the attack name, now he should teleport and do one, two, boom. Very nice. So this one uh, I can block, but this one I have to teleport away from. That's why I added this. Um, and here's a stagger. Block, block, and teleport. Great, and one thing to note about this teleport is while I'm invisible, so this one, while I'm invisible, uh, I'm also invincible. Uh, but this we haven't touched on yet, but I will show you uh, later, this invincibility frames. Uh, one other thing, you see that once the when, when the boss starts attacking, if I move away, he doesn't rotate to face me, he just stays in the same direction. And this is because all of these attacks that we're doing have root motion, and by default, root motion doesn't make uh, uh, locks the rotation of um, a, a mesh. So if you want to override that, which is very important, if you do, um, you can go over to your character movement, search for rotation, and you'll see allow physics rotation during root motion. This says during root motion. So if I check this box and play now as I'm as he's doing the attack and I'm spinning he's rotating to face me see that even during his attack not during the stagger of course but yeah during the attack he's rotating to face me now this is something you can enable if you want you can disable if you want them to start the attack and keep facing the same direction up to you all right so now that we have two different attacks um, Let's choose one of them at random as well. So right now in our behavior tree, this is called the combo one sequence. Let's just call it the uh, random combo sequence. And let's have it choose an attack at random. So we have two attacks now. We have combo one and combo two. How do we choose one of them randomly? Well, we're gonna create also a very handy um, decorator called chance. So new decorator, uh, BTD blueprint base, put it in our decorators folder and call it BTD chance. And it's the same as the random chance function we created for the player during the stagger. So for decorators, as usual, you override the perform conditional check AI. Um, and we're going to need a variable called um, percent, which is going to be a float. And you can say, you can force it to be between zero and one and the value zero and one to make sure that you don't pass any other value. And then you're going to generate a random float in the range of zero and one and check. Uh, is this percent greater than or equal the random float? And you will just return this percent. That's basically it. It's a very simple decorator. And how we use, oh, make sure to click the eye icon. I forgot to do that. And how do we use it in our behavior tree? I'm going to create a selector to select between one of those, right? So that how the selector works is if one fails, it selects the other. So let's just add a decorator. Now let's make it combo one. It doesn't really matter, but yeah, for naming conventions, let's have combo one followed by combo two and add the decorator on this one, btd chance, and let's give it a, did I not compile? I did not compile. And let's give it a percent of 0.5. So 50% of the time it will do combo one and other 50% combo one will fail. So it will do combo two. And that's how you choose between two different um, uh, nodes. So let's see how this looks. In all cases, he will teleport. That was combo one. That was combo two. Perfect. So again, combo one and combo two. Excellent. So it was really 50% exactly in both times. All right. 
Now uh, it's time to move on to something a bit more exciting and this is what's going to give the boss uh, the feeling of being uh, of doing different attacks and actually using the environment. So far the boss has just been um, doing melee attacks, teleporting to the targets uh, and doing the regular combos but not using the environment. So we're going to add uh, an ability for the boss to throw their axe from specific points in the arena. So it's going to be sort of a projectile effect, but it's going to be the axe in their hand that they're actually throwing. So I think that's uh, going to look pretty cool. So let's uh, let's do that. So first we need to create a projectile. Um, and if you don't remember what we did in our projectiles, I suggest going back to the projectile tutorial to see um, everything we created here. Uh, but we're going to create a new projectile off of projectile base. So right click create child blueprint, and we're going to call it BP projectile X. Open it up. So usually what we do is we just add, um, no, actually I'm not going to call it X. It's not just an X. It's a spinning X. So let's make sure that we name it correctly. It's a spinning X. And I'm going to make it spin inside the projectile class itself. But usually what we do here is we go to our static mesh and override this to be um, our whatever mesh we want. And uh, let me rotate it on the uh, x-axis 90. Yeah. So now I wanted to, uh, before, before actually changing the box collision size, I wanted to rotate, right? And if it rotates, uh, it's going to rotate along the z-axis like this. Now, you see the problem here is that it's rotating along the origin point, and the origin point is at the tip of the axe. So it rotates, uh, it has a very big spin radius. I actually want it to rotate from the center uh, of the axe uh, and not from the tip. So how do we do that? To do that, I'm actually gonna ignore this mesh completely. Uh, so I'm gonna undo, I'm not gonna use this mesh. Let's clear this as well. I'm going to keep it as is, and I'm going to create a new element here called scene. Uh, and this is just going to be our rotation point. So I'm going to call it um, a rotation point. And I'm going to add a new mesh, so a new static mesh, inside this rotation point. Oh, it's already added. This a child of the rotation point. And this is going to be our axe mesh. All right, and I'm going to rotate this uh, again uh, 90 on the z on the x axis and now this rotation point is at the center uh, of uh, the actual actor the projectile actor so if i move the static mesh now to be at the center of the rotation point so yeah something like here and if i rotate now this rotation point the x rotates along its center and that's exactly what we want. We want the axe to rotate along its center so it doesn't have a very large spinning radius because then it looks pretty weird and hard to avoid. All right, um, now we can set the size of our box collision to be exactly as the axe. So let's make this, yeah, this can be 80. This should also match it. So this should be a square because of course um, it's going to rotate in this entire area, so we should fill it. And um, yeah, the height can be a bit lowered to, I don't know, 10. Yeah, maybe even less if we want to be really accurate. I don't know, 5. That's fine. Um, and then we also want a trail effect. So I want it to have a trail when it's spinning. So um, we're going to add in our static mesh, a particle system. Now, if you have Niagara, use Niagara. I have an old one, so I'm using the uh, uh, the old particle system. I'm going to call this trail effect. And I'm going to use the same one that I'm using for the axe. I think, yeah, it's uh, this one. Yep, so I'm going to just plug it in here. And this one, I'm going to make sure it's at the tip of the axe. So as the axe is rotating, so does this. Yeah. 
Now let's actually make the axe um, spin when uh, we start uh, moving this projectile. So in the event graph, I'm gonna make a custom event, call it spin axe. Um, and it's gonna be pretty simple. It's just gonna be a timeline. So I'm gonna add a timeline because we're doing something over time and we're gonna call this the uh, rotation timeline. Uh, double click to open it up. Um, it's gonna be pretty short. It's gonna be say 0.2 seconds and then add a float track, call it uh, Z rotation. And right click add key at point zero, it's zero. And right click add key again at point 0 0.2, it's um, negative 360. So I want it to spin one full rotation, which is 360 degrees, but in the opposite direction, so uh, counterclockwise, that's why the negative. And I wanted to do it in 0.2 seconds. So you go from zero to negative 360 in 0.2 seconds. And then back here, uh, we want to um, add a, uh, sorry, get our rotation point and say set world rotation on each update. And we're gonna split this. Um, the value of the new rotation, uh, sorry, the value of the X and the Y should be, uh, yeah, whatever they start with. So you can just get them here and say, get world rotation. Now, of course you can assume they're zero because they are, but if you change them here, it's good that they reflect here as well. So this will be the X, this will be the Y, and this will be the Z. All right, and then on begin play, we just call spin X. Perfect. Now if I go over here and say simulate, it, sp it spins only once and then stops, right? Spins once and stops. So what we want to do is when we're finished spinning, just call spin X again. So then it spins continuously. And now if I go over here and simulate, I didn't compile, so if I compile and then simulate, still, why, why isn't, oh, sorry. Compile, simulate, no, it didn't work. Oh, because this is play, not play from start. Uh, that should do it, let's try now. Simulate, yeah, now it's spinning continuously. Great. Yeah, very nice. Um, now you can of course change the uh, the spin speed by adjusting this um, time from 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 to one. Yeah, it depends how fast you want it to spin, of course. The less time, the faster it will be. Now we want this boss to throw uh, the ax, right? So now we created the projectile, let's start throwing it. So back in our boss here, uh, in this attacks area, uh, let's create a new attack. So add custom events, I'm gonna call it throw axe. And I'll delete this. And this just takes into input again, as all the other attacks do, and attack target. Um, it will call the attack base that we usually call, and then it will play a montage. Now I already have a montage set up here. So animations, axe, uh, where is it? Throw axe, yeah. So it just looks like this. As you can see, it's just a regular axe swing. But at this point, I call a montage notify called throw. So in this point, we'll spawn the projectile and hide the axe from the enemy's hand. So it looks like they actually threw it, but we're not gonna throw the actual axe that they're holding. Um, all right, so get our mesh and plug in the throw montage and then switch on notify on begin. Sorry, not here on begin. And it was called throw, I believe. So when throw happens, we just want to spawn an actor from class. And this class is the spinning axe projectile. 
the spawn transform here is important. So uh, actually the location is important. So I need to spawn it where the hand is, the right hand that's holding the ax. So I'm gonna get my mesh and I'm gonna say get socket location. Was it get socket location or get socket world? Yeah, I think it's just get socket location. And the socket is hand underscore R and that's the location here. The speed, I want it to be very fast, so it's hard to hit. Uh, again, all of the, uh, going back to uh, rule number two, it's predictable, so I'm going to make it very clear that the boss will throw the ax, but it's challenging, so it's a lot faster than all the other projectiles that we've faced so far. Um, and the target is the attack target here, so that it aims it at the player. And the instigator is self. And I'm also gonna make it homing. That means it follows the player. Now, because it's really fast, it's not gonna, uh, it's, the player's not gonna have time to actually, uh, the, the projectile's not gonna have time to spin around the player. Uh, but if the player moves slightly while the boss is throwing the projectile, it will still follow them. So again, making it a bit more challenging to avoid. Um, and once we spawn it, uh, we just say uh, assign on projectile impact. This is the event that's dispatched when the projectile hits something. Um, now, when we hit something, you can check, did I hit my attack target? You can check if this actor is equal to attack target and only then do damage or just do damage all the time, which is what I'm gonna do because I don't really care who I hit. Even if I hit myself or friendly, I'm still gonna do damage. Uh, damage causer is self. The damage info is um, make damage info. So this should be, let's say, takes 20 damage, damage type projectile, hit reaction, can be blocked but can't be parried. All right, uh, and another important thing we forgot to do is as soon as we spawn, the projectile, we also want to hide the sword that's in our hand, right? So we can just over here uh, get our weapon. We already have a reference to that and say set visibility of its mesh of or really of anything, it's fine, to not visible. And once we're done, so over here on completed and on interrupted, set visibility to is visible again and call attack end. Always make sure to call attack end if you're not using one of the BPC attacks because they already call it by default. Um, are we missing something? Nope, let's test it out. So first, let's add it to our enum of attacks. Let's call it throw axe, and also add it to our uh, BTT boss attack here. We're gonna call throw axe, plug it in here, pass the attack target. This function is gonna look like spaghetti once we have a lot of attacks, but for now it's fine. And then back here, um, let's, just for testing now, let's remove all of, let's remove both of these and just call uh, the attack with throw axe. By the way, we should rename these to be uh, combo one, this one to combo two, just so it's clear what they are, and this one to throw X. All right, so let's see how this looks like. Oh, he's actually gonna teleport to me. Let's remove the teleport. I don't want him to teleport. Let's just see. And he's throwing the X, do it in slow motion. Yes, yes, woo, nice. Okay, so a few things. Uh, the X is rotating in the wrong direction. So he throws the X, we'll watch again and it rotates, oh no, actually it's rotating in the right direction. Oh, that's good. But it spawns uh, a bit weirdly. So if you look at it 
it spawns with its head facing him. It should be with the head facing me. So I can really change that very simply by going here. And instead of rotating it 90, I'm gonna rotate it negative 90. And then move it back to the center. Now it should spawn better. Yeah, that's much better. It looks like it actually spawned. And now we need a sound when it hits me and an effect. We don't have any of that. We don't have a, a hit. Uh, we have a block effect sound, uh, but we don't have a one on impact. So let's add that. So in our projectile here, uh, we can go to the class settings. So for the impact effect, uh, I think we have this um, Sparrow Alt, uh, again from the Paragon Gideon Sparrow. You'll see what it looks like. Uh, for the impact sound, I have this void impact, sounds like this. And for the spawn sound, well, let's just do the axe swing. So the same sound you get when you swing the axe. Uh, Alright, so putting all that together now, looks like this. Yep, Sparrow impact is just loading now. Yeah, much better. Look at it again. All right, and if I block it, perfect slow motion. Boom, looks great. Uh, one thing to note though is this axe is smaller than the boss's axe because the boss is scaled up 1.25 times. Um, so actually we might wanna scale up this mesh as well to 1.25, which would mean we need to expand the box collision a bit to 100, 100, yeah, I think that's all right. Let's move it to the center again. All right, now it should be the same size as his axe. Yeah, very nice. Okay, so I told you that we're gonna be using the arena for this, right? So right now the boss just throws the axe while standing in place. To make it more interesting, I want the boss to teleport to specific uh, points of interest in the arena and throw the axe from there. So that the enemy constantly has to look and face the boss uh, to see where they are and where they're throwing the axe. Obviously right now the player can block with his back to the enemy. Uh, this is a bug that we should fix at some point. Uh, blocking should only be when you're facing the direction of the attack. But this is the point of having the boss teleport. So the player has to think where the boss is at this point. So I want the boss to move to um, one of four locations on the arena randomly. So either move here, move here, move here, or move here to one of the edges of the arena. But how do I do that? How do I mark a place for the boss to move? Well, to do that, I'm gonna create um, an actor and place it around the world. So. Over here, let's go to our uh, content um, enemies AI. So somewhere here, uh, I'm gonna create a new blueprint class of type uh, actor, just a regular actor. I'm gonna call it BP uh, POI um, actor. So point of interest uh, actor. Um, and I'm not gonna do anything. It's just, I'm not gonna do anything inside the actor. I just want a class with uh, with this name. All right, and I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna place it where I want it. So one of them should be here. Uh, let's actually place it right in the center. And then, yeah, this is the center. And then move it over here, so one will be here. Another one, I'm just Alt and drag to duplicate. Another one will be here. Then another one, let's copy it again, move it to the center, but now to this side and Alt and drag one last time and move it here. All right, so now we have four of these actors scattered across these different points. And now we want the boss to pick one of them at random, but make sure that it's the one of the furthest ones. So how do we, uh, find the location of an actor randomly. Now, of course, I can do get distance and find the location of the actor with specific class, but I wanna show you a new way of using the environment query system or the EQS. 
So we're going to go over here in EQS and we're going to create a new one. So right click and create new environment query. So search for environment query. I'm going to call this EQS uh, furthest POI actor. All right. Um, by the way, I noticed I named this actor and it's already an actor. So maybe just BP POI instead of PP POI actor. <clears throat> All right, so now in this uh, EQS for this POI actor, I'm going to show you how you can create an EQS that instead of generating um, a grid of points, it generates a grid of locations of specific actors. So I'm going to pull here and say actors of class. And then the class that I'm going to pick is our POI, our point of interest. And I'm going to say search radius, like something like 3000. So search for actors of type of, of class BP POI in a 3000 units radius. And then when you find one, I'm going to add a test. So right click, add a test distance. Uh, I'm going to just do score only and say prefer greater. So whichever has the greatest distance will have the highest score. Um, and of course, this generates it around the querier. So it generates this around the person that's querying the EQS, which is our boss. Now to test it out, let's get our handy testing pawn here and change the EQS to be the furthest POI. And now you can see how it works. So these are the point of interests. It puts a dot around each one of them, see? So if I'm standing close to this one, this has the lowest score, and this is the furthest one, so this has the highest score. And if I move, then this one has a lower score, this one gets a higher score, and so on. So this is how you can actually look for specific actors in a scene and then do certain tests like this distance test or line of sight or whatever tests that we were doing in the previous EQSs. So I think it's a very handy way and uh, used for a lot of uh, cool things. <clears throat> All right, so uh, now let's create our throw axe sequence to use this new EQS. Let's see how it's gonna look like. Back here, uh, I'm gonna undo this, put these back. And this is already one complete attack sequence. I'm just gonna move it somewhere. Oh, let's move it somewhere to the left here. Uh, to the right, I mean, and let's create a new one, a new sequence and call it the axe, the throw axe sequence. So this is how the sequence starts. First of all, it clears focus, then runs an EQS. The EQS that it runs is the uh, POI thing, find for this POI. And we're going to say, um, don't get the single best, so don't get the furthest one, but get uh, random from the best 25. So it's not going to pick the closest one, but it's going to pick one of the two furthest ones to also give it a bit of variability. If you always move to the furthest one, then you're just moving from one side to the other. And store it in the point of interest blackboard key. Then teleport to the point of interest. Remember that, that this is location or attack target, so I can give it a point of interest, which is a location. After you teleport to it, uh, focus. So look at the attack target and throw your axe. So now let's uh, test out this uh, axe throw sequence. So it goes, teleports, and throws the axe. Great. And now he's going to keep teleporting to the furthest uh, point of interest. And he's going to keep throwing the axe because we don't have a cooldown. There's nothing to end it, right? Uh, but I don't want him to keep picking the same two because right now he's just picking two out of the four. And that's because these are the furthest ones from each other. So let me modify the EQS a bit. So instead of just prefer greater distance, let's actually not do that. Let's just filter um, very close ones and have it just pick one at random, right? So we're going to filter uh, anything that's closer than, let's say, 500 units, right? Uh, and then um, for the others, pick at random. So now he's picking that one, 
Then he's picking this one. Then he's picking that one. Yeah, so now he's going to different ones at random. I think this looks a lot better. So now you really have to think, oh, he's here. Oh, now he's here. Yeah, nice. All right, so what would happen if we put a cooldown on this uh, sequence? So right now, if I add a cooldown, let's say uh, 10 seconds. So the boss will start by doing the regular attack sequence. He didn't teleport to me for some reason. Oh, we removed the teleport. Oopsie. Okay. So the boss will start doing the regular uh, attack sequence, right? And then once the other one is ready, which is uh, usually 10 seconds later, any second now, he's going to go throw the axe once and then come back and do the regular attack sequence, right? But what if I want him to throw the axe multiple times? Well, then I can... Uh, on this throw axe uh, attack, I can add a loop. So say, do this four times. Well, let's decrease the cooldown a bit to like five seconds. All right, so now he does his normal attack sequence. As soon as five seconds are up, he throws his axe once, twice, but he's doing it from the same place, right? He's throwing his axe four times and then goes back and does the normal attack sequence. But I don't want him to just throw his ax four times. I want him to do the whole sequence four times. So then we can add a loop on the whole thing. So I'm gonna take this loop and add it here. So now, regular attack. And one teleport. Oh, he did it only once. Um, okay, so here's another thing. So this uh, cooldown, as soon as it finished, um, the loop was only done once. Why? Because on the second loop, uh, this was already on cooldown. So what we're going to do is create two nested sequences. So we have a sequence here and another one here. And this sequence is going to be the regular attack one with the loop. And this one is just going to be the one with the cooldown. So now if I do this, after five seconds, he's going to go throw the axe once, twice, very nice, three times, and four times. Now it's on cooldown and he's back. Perfect. Still on cooldown, so he's still doing regular attacks, and once it stops, he's going to do it. So now, the reason we added two sequences is because this whole thing has one cooldown, but once it's not on cooldown, then this can repeat. You can't repeat a loop with a cooldown if its cooldown is still running. So this is very important. All right, now one thing I want to add also this throw axe sequence is once it ends, I want the player, the boss to teleport to the player, but do a specific attack every time and not do uh, whatever is next uh, here. So, and this attack is, uh, let me show it to you. I have a montage for it. Uh, it's called Quick Attack. So this Quick Attack is just a single slash, but um, it's pretty quick, well, quicker than the other combos. Um, and the reason I want this is so that the player counts or the player knows and be able to predict, oh, after four axe throws, he's gonna teleport and do the Quick Attack. And this quick attack will always be will always stagger the enemy if parried. So it's a high risk, high reward situation for the player. So let's see how we're gonna do that. Um, over here in the in the boss, uh, we're just gonna create a new custom event. Call it quick attack. Takes as input the attack target. And it's going to be the same as the first combo. So it just does the primary melee attack from uh, the BPC attacks. So I'm going to copy that and paste it here. Whoa, what happened? Okay, so the only thing that's different, of course, is uh, that we're going to be doing the quick attack montage here. And maybe, um, yeah, this one can be blocked, can be parried. 
And notice I won't make the enemy interruptible. Uh, so I won't make the enemy non-interruptible. So he is interruptible. That means if you parry, you have a 100% chance of staggering the enemy. Um, let's plug in attack target. And let's say damage is also 20. So to demonstrate it, uh, let me just make the axe throw um, two loops so it's a bit quicker. And let's make the cooldown. Um, let's just remove the cooldown. <laughs> Okay, let's make it one second. Uh, and now, once this is done, so once the loops are over, I'm gonna have uh, another sequence here called the quick attack. And what it does is it teleports, boss teleports to the attack target and then calls uh, attack, uh, boss attack. Oh, we didn't add the teleports to our attack enum. So this is, uh, sorry, the quick attack. So in our attack enum here, go quick attack as a new one. And then back here in our BTT attacks, uh, we're gonna call quick, oh, sorry, pull off of boss ref and call quick attack. So we're adding it in the attack based on name function, uh, which is inside the uh, BTT attack. Uh, all right, so now I can select it from here. Quick attack, attack target, and let's just call it quick attack. All right, so now when the loop is over, he's gonna always do the quick attack and then go back to doing whatever is not on cooldown. So let's see how this looks like. It has a cooldown of one second. So now one second is over, throw axe once, throw axe twice, and teleport quick attack. Perfect. Do a regular sequence. Let me show it to you again and show you that um, you can always parry it. So throw axe once, twice, and boom. Actually, I did not parry it. Why is that? Uh, is this by any chance non-interruptible? Nope. This should have staggered the enemy. Let's try it again, sorry. And throw axe once, throw axe twice, and parry. Yeah, okay. So maybe the first time I just blocked it, I didn't parry correctly, or it wasn't compiled. But now uh, this is working uh, correctly. You can put back the cooldown to whatever number you want it. Um, we're gonna be modifying all of, once we have all the attacks ready, we're gonna be modifying how they behave together, what has cooldown, when, how they interact uh, to make the boss fight feel more uh, measured and calculated. Nice, awesome. The boss fight is really starting to come together now. We have multiple unique attacks and abilities and we're using the arena. And the next tutorial is going to be the last one uh, and we're going to add a few more cool attacks and abilities and then we're going to combine it all together uh, for the final fight so i hope you enjoy it and i'll see you there